Hey everyone, uh, it's good to be here this morning uh, and uh, to spend some time around God's Word and obviously what we're looking at today is the, the trial of Jesus and my aim um, as we reflect on, on the trial of, of Jesus is to reflect on the person and the character of Jesus through uh, this event and uh, allow our minds uh, to reflect on him and, and worship him through this process. So let us pray to that end and then we'll get started. Uh, our wonderful Father, we want to say thank you for this time of year where we reflect and remember um, this uh, final week before uh, your passion and, and your crucifixion and resurrection. And we say thank you, Father, that uh, we can... Uh, consider and reflect upon those things today. May you lead us in worship uh, of yourself, uh, that our hearts would be turned to you and you would receive the honour and the glory that you deserve uh, as, as we consider your word this morning. So we commit our time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we are... Let, uh, let's uh, just cast our minds to where we are in Passion Week. So we've been through the, well, today is actually Palm Sunday, isn't it? So we had Palm Sunday and we had the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on, Mo on the Sunday and the Monday and Jesus goes into the temple on, on the Tuesday and has an argument with the chief priests uh, in the temple on the on the Tuesday and they're wanting to arrest him but they can't arrest him because of the crowds. On Wednesday we find uh, that the chief priests come together again uh, uh, and consider how they're going to arrest Jesus. And Jesus goes to the house of Simon the leper and he is anointed uh, before his death at the house of Simon the leper on the Wednesday. And then we find ourselves on Thursday and uh, Tim led us through that last week where uh, Jesus shares his last meal with his disciples and we have the feet washing and then we, after that we have Jesus uh, going to the Garden of Gethsemane. We have Judas betraying Jesus uh, to uh, the chief priests and we have um, Jesus arrests in the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane and the 12 disciples abandoning him. So that's where we're at and that's where we pick up today in the story of Jesus' uh, arrest. So when we, when we consider and when we start to think about uh, Jesus' trial, uh, as you can see, it's not, not, not straightforward and it's even less straightforward than what we read this morning. There's actually more going on than what even we covered uh, this morning because the Gospels have many different uh, stories about Jesus' trial. But there are, there are some central, central participants in Jesus' trials and uh, we're just going to briefly have a look at that before we just jump into the text. And... And primar primarily and, and wonderfully, Jesus is, is the central character uh, of, of the trials. And uh, we saw this morning uh, in the Revelation song, uh, we see in the Revelation song, which is based out of Revelation chapter 5, where Jesus comes and his lamb, uh, the, one, the only one who is worthy to open the scroll. And that's what that song is all about. But there you have that. Uh, juxta juxtaposition of, of Jesus as mighty God, as wonderful, as counsellor against his humility uh, of, of being the lamb, the one silent before his executioners. And that's the picture that we have today when we, we consider Jesus in his trial. And uh, I encourage you to meditate that on that as we, we consider those images that we see of Jesus during his trial. But probably the, 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 the chief protagonists in this whole event uh, are the chief priests, chief protagonists as well. And the chief, so who are the chief, the chief priests? 
uh, because up until this time, we, we have Jesus interacting with the Pharisees, with the Sadducees, uh, with the teachers of the law, with the scribes, perhaps, uh, from here and there. And then suddenly we've got the chief priests, and this whole trial is, is the effort of the chief priests. Uh, so who is this mob? Are they the senior priests? Are they the old priests? Who, who are the chief priests? Well, we need to, to unpack this a little bit uh, to understand what's, what was going on in, in Israel during that time. But there was definitely a class, uh, a political class, uh, called the, the chief, pe- ple- uh, chief police, chief priests in the time of, of Jesus. So now, we need to cast out, go back a little bit in history to understand how this all came about. Uh, most of you would have heard of Hanukkah, right? We've all heard of Hanukkah. Hanukkah is our holiday, the Jewish holiday, around Christmas time. In fact, uh, this year, I think it, it, uh, Hanukkah is on the 25th of December. So Hanukkah is the celebration of the, the Maccabees. That's another name you might have heard of. So the Maccabees were the ones that overthrew the Seleucidean uh, Empire, the Greeks who ruled Israel uh, uh, pre-turn of the millennium, so a couple of hundred years before Jesus. So the Greeks ruled Israel and the Maccabees freed the nation of Israel from uh, the Greeks and Israel became self-determining again. So they had a high priest at that time and I'm going to put up a, a diagram. I'm not sure how good your eyes are but uh, up on the top there you have Matthias Maccabee. And Matthias Maccabee was the chief priest during the time of the Greeks, okay, the Greek rule. His son was Judas Maccabee. He led the, the revolution and freed Israel from the Greeks. Uh, his friend in the, res- in, in the revolution or leaders of the revolutionary group uh, to his left and to his right, you can see with the little faces, those guys became high priest and king. So at this point in history, what happens is the high priest is there, the high priest and his, his, the, a group of high priests and priestly families led this revolution, freed Israel, and then instituted the priest as the king of the nation. So at this point in history, the high priest and the king were one. And this goes all the way down... Uh, to the bottom uh, right on that that, uh, table where you can see the the kingship of Israel is handed to Herod the Great. So now we're into the time of Jesus, right? So all the way through, this is the high priest being king, the king of the nation. And Israel and the chief priests, so the chief priests were the ruling classes at this time, in Israel, who determined uh, what went on politically, they determined, listen, we can no longer afford to have a a Jewish king. We've got to actually get someone who Rome, Rome is growing in power and they're going to overtake us, they're going to take us over. So let's get in place someone who is going to be acceptable to Rome. So they approach Herod, Herod the Great, who is an Edomite or Idumean king, and they ask him to be king of Israel. And they appoint him king, He marries the daughter of the high priest king of Israel and he becomes king of Israel. He's not Jewish, so he can't be high priest. Okay? So he must appoint a high priest. And at this point, the high priest and the king separate. This is in the life of Jesus. So Herod the Great starts appointing high priests. And the appointment of the high priest comes from this chief priest group political class of families that rule Israel. And whenever a high priest that from this point on is chosen, it is to be from this chief priest uh, political class that exists in Israel at that time. Does that make sense? So now we understand that the chief priest were these groups of family, about seven or eight families that were a political class, they were priests as well, 
but they were the families from which the high priests were then chosen. Herod the Great goes on and he chooses in his lifetime six high priests uh, during his lifetime. Um, he murders at least one of those high priests, uh, which happens to be his brother-in-law, uh, whom he murders, uh, and, uh, and then later um, uh, he... The, the only high priest that we're aware of in the story of Jesus, which is Annas, the high priest, is not chosen by Herod the Great at all. So Herod dies, as we know. Jesus, Herod, Herod the Great is the Herod at Jesus' birth who kills all the children in Bethlehem, right? Okay, so Herod dies and he replaced, he's replaced, and Rome accept this, he's replaced by his three sons, Herod Antipas, Herod Philippi, and Herod Archelaus. Herod Archelaus rules in Jerusalem and over the southern part of the, Israel, of the Judean area, and uh, Antipas is in around Galilee, right? So Herod Antipas is the guy, Herod the Great's son, who rules over Judea, whom Pilate sends Jesus to, okay, in the story that we just read. So that's Herod Antipas, Herod the Great's son. Herod Archelaus, who would rule over Jerusalem, only ruled a shorter period of time and he was kicked out by Rome. They didn't like him. They removed him. So they, and they replaced him by Quirinius, who we've all heard of as well. So Quirinius replaces him. And then successively Quirinius is replaced by another Roman prefect, by another Roman prefect, by another, and, uh, and eventually replaced by Pilate. So Pilate is Herod Archelaus' uh, successor. Okay? So, Herod Archelaus would be the one that would normally appoint the priest, okay, but he, the high priest, but he's out of the picture by now. So Quirinius, he appoints the first priest that Rome appoints, so no longer is other Herods under control of appointing the priests. The first priest now that Rome appoints, and Rome starts to appoint all the priests going forward after this, so the priest, high priest role is an appointment by the Roman governor of the time. So the first high priest appointed by Rome is Annas, and Annas is the one who is the father-in-law of Caiaphas and who also stands in judgment over Jesus. So that's Annas, the high priest. And he rules from about 6 AD to about 12 AD, I think it is. The other high priest in the story of, the, of, of Jesus' trial is Caiaphas. So Caiaphas is is, well, Annas' son-in-law, uh, for one. So again, there's that, that chief priest family. It's all interrelated, it's all family, it's all chosen from this same political priestly class. Okay? And Caiaphas is appointed by uh, Valerius uh, Glastus, um, one of the prefects at the time. And that was before Pilate was appointed. And Pilate never appoints a high priest, although because Caiaphas is high priest all through his reign and there was no need to remove Caiaphas. But if the, there was a need to have a new high priest, if Rome thought so, Pilate would have been the one that would have appointed the high priest. And it generally went to the highest bidder. Okay, So whoever could come up with the most amount of money and bribe uh, the Roman prefect, or Herod at the time, got the job of high priest. So it was all about this, and the political class and the chief priest, uh, was, it was very well known that they just took the offerings of the people. So that when the people would bring their offering to the temple in Jerusalem, that was going to the high priest and the chief priest and their families. And so they're an extremely wealthy uh, class in the nation of Israel. And of course, if you're Jewish, you couldn't just up and go to another church. <laughs> you couldn't 
give your offering somewhere else, could you? You had to participate in this corrupt system because that's what God called you to do. So it was actually for people who wanted to follow God and those who were, were seeking to worship God, they had to participate in this corrupt system that was ruled by these corrupt, murderous people. They had no choice. They couldn't boycott it. God asked them to bring their offerings. God asked them to bring their sacrifices and they had to do it via this corrupt system. So this is where we're at uh, in this system that uh, we find ourselves in in, in the first cent- century. Pontius Pilate, uh, we've already talked about him, he's, he was the prefect, the Roman prefect over Jerusalem at the time. He stays there uh, up until 36 uh, AD, uh, at the same time that Caiaphas is removed, actually. And, and we also have reference to the scribes and the elders in these, in these stories of uh, Jesus' trials. And the scribes and the elders is really reference to the Sanhedrin, the council, uh, in, in most of the, the ways in which it's used in the passages that we're looking at. And the Sanhedrin is the 71 elders or judges of Israel which uh, preside over the judicial hearings uh, in, in, uh, in, in Israel at the time. Uh, it was chaired by the high priest, so the high priest was the chair, he was the one, and the 70 were f- from uh, the leaders in Israel. So those who were learned scribes, teachers of the law, Pharisees, Sadducees, uh, were part of the, the, the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin met, importantly, met every day, uh, except on the Sabbath uh, and on festivals, in the temple, in uh, uh in specific place and there were very specific rules in the Mishnah about how a trial was to be conducted Um, and we'll have a look at that as we go along. So they're the main players uh, and now when we start to talk about the the trial it begins to open up exactly what is going on there and how corrupt and and why uh, Jesus was led to his death as he was so as we as we think about uh, um, Jesus' trial the, 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 the main instigators for Jesus' arrest uh, and his trial were the chief priests so there was this corrupt political class who wanted Jesus out of the way but what was motivating the chief priests why did they why did they want him out of the way well after jesus's ah uh, sorry after lazarus's resurrection uh jesus causes quite a stir with that and um and this is just prior to jesus triumphal entry into jerusalem uh john records this for us and uh we'll pick up on on the third line uh the Pharisees gathered the council, that would be the Sanhedrin, and said, what are we to do? This man, Jesus, performs many signs, and if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So the motivation be- behind the chief priests and the Pharisees here is losing their place, their position their authority, their power uh, in Israel. So th- this was all about fear of losing out and uh, losing their position and place. And their response, their fear response here is, and it's given by Caiaphas, the high priest, he says, but one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people and not the whole nation should perish. So Caiaphas stands up and says, listen, you guys, you've got no idea what you're talking about here. What we've got to do is we've got to kill this guy. It's better for him to die than for us to lose our positions, right? So let's go about it. And that the plan is set in place. It's a plan. It's a plan... 
uh, that comes about because of their fear of protecting their own positions and for wanting uh, to sacrifice anybody and anything uh, in order to protect themselves. However, the high priest and the chief priest have a problem. And the problem is, when Jesus came into Jerusalem on the Sunday, he was met with huge crowds, right? Huge crowds. Jerusalem was full of people from uh, Galilee who all knew Jesus and there was and lots of people from all over Israel and they were excited to see this Jesus, this prophet. And when he turns up into the, in the temple then he argues with the chief priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they want to arrest him but they can't. Jesus has become super popular. So they want to kill this dude but how do we do it now? This guy is growing so quickly in popularity, how do we do it? Well, on the Wednesday morning, as I mentioned before, the chief priests come together and Mark records this. It was now two days before Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest Jesus by stealth and to kill him, for they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. So this was the answer, okay? The guy's so popular, we've got to do it by stealth. We've got to do it at night. Uh, we've got to do it in a way that no one knows. And we're going to do it quickly. And so that's their plan. They're going to take Jesus by night. Uh, they're going to take him and, and have him murdered as quickly as possible. But it wasn't as simple as just putting a knife through Jesus. They had to do it in a way that was going to be politically acceptable uh, and not cause a fuss to their Roman um, rulers. So when we start to look at the trial of Jesus and how it actually occurs, this is how it occurs. Um, on Thursday night, there is this hearing before Annas. Annas is the old high priest, but he still holds a... a, 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 a he's still held in high regard. And he's brought... Jesus is brought before Annas. Then he's taken to Caiaphas, the, the current high priest, at his house, at Caiaphas's house, uh, on the Thursday evening and wo as well. At first light, so daybreak, uh, he's brought before the council of the whole house whole Sanhedrin, uh, before they take him to Pilate um, to be tried there. Pilate hands him over to Herod Antipas in the middle of that trial and Herod hands him back to Pilate who eventually um, condemns Jesus to crucifixion. And you can see the first three hearings or trials that Jesus goes through is a, reli a religious trials and he's found guilty at all three. And the, the final three, uh, he's found innocent uh, by um, Gentiles uh, for, I suppose, political um, crimes of being the king of Israel. So let's work our way through those. So the first hearing is before Annas, and it, it appears in John's Gospel, uh, and this is all we have. There's nothing in any of the other Gospels. Uh, it comes from John chapter 18. And here we have Jesus. This is the first place they come to after they arrest him in Gethsemane. They bring Jesus before Annas, the former high priest. And he questions Jesus about his teaching, uh, the types of things that he's teaching. And, and, he talk, and he questions him about his disciples. And, and Jesus gives him an honest answer uh, in response and uh, this is where Jesus is struck and starts to endure the uh, indignity and, and uh, I suppose, the, the, the punishment being meted out by both soldiers and uh, the, the priests and the high priests and the Sanhedrin. But it's, I suppose here we do have Jesus talking, but... Uh, as we go through the rest of the trial, uh, trials of Jesus, both before Caiaphas in Caiaphas's house at the Sanhedrin, 
uh, before Pilate and particularly before Herod. Uh, Jesus actually is um, deliberately um, shown as being silent before his accusers. And it, this is very deliberate by, by the writers. They want us to reflect on Jesus' silence before his accusers. And that is because they, they um, particularly want us to uh, reflect on Isaiah 53. Uh, and to be thinking about Jesus in those, in that context. And Isaiah 53, 7 says this, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth, uh, like a lamb that is, is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he is taken away. And Jesus, uh, Jesus' silence points to his innocence, points to him being that lamb, that innocent uh, one, and, and that's what the writers are, are, are seeking to convey to us, that this was the lamb, this was the innocent one standing before the trial, uh, standing before uh, those who were accusing him, but was innocent of the crimes being, um, being thrust upon him. And furthermore, it speaks to the fact that in his silence, he, even though he, he says nothing, he is actually in control. Uh, that he is the one not being controlled. He is one there by his own volition, not being one dragged kicking and screaming into a, a trial against his will, as it were. This is one, this is the, the suffering lamb who willingly uh, enters into this trial in order to facilitate the redemption of a people. It's our God who is in control. From Annas' house, uh, the soldiers take him uh, to Caiaphas's house. Caiaphas's house would have been, um, the high priest's house would have been, uh, is next to the temple in Jerusalem and, um, and was quite a large place, as you can imagine. He was fairly well off. And uh, he was brought into to Caiaphas's house, and and the hearing before Caiaphas in his house and the hearing before the Sanhedrin are, are, are extremely similar. Uh, in fact, one, you know, we won't talk about why, but but they're extremely similar. So the stories are, are very much the same. The, the the narrative is the same. The responses are the same. And so what we'll deal what we'll do is we'll deal with those together. Uh, as we run through this. Now, as, as the chief priest and the, and the high priest uh, bring Jesus uh, before the Sanhedrin, before the elders and before uh, the rulers here, um, they've, got a, they've got a major issue. They've got to try and convince uh, the religious leaders that Jesus is someone that they need to get rid of uh, in, in a way that is palatable uh, to both to the religious leaders, to those who oppose it, and there were those that opposed it uh, amongst the, the Sanhedrin, um, Nicodemus being one. And, and then they also had to present Jesus uh, um, as someone worthy of death to the political class or the political rulers of, of Rome as well. So how are they to do this so the chief priests and Caiaphas first well their tactic is well we've got to have Jesus uh, convicted uh, under Jewish law as a blasphemer but we can't execute him as such so that's what they go about to do now in a, in a Jewish trial a, a, first you need witnesses and, and, and we see that the chief priests they call witnesses uh, they, they seek false testimony, but they can't get any of that to work for them. Uh, the, the witnesses don't agree and, and, and so on and so forth. So in a, from, a, from, from a legal sense, uh, from the Sanhedrin's point of view, if you can't get witnesses, then you must get a confession. So that's, that's the high priest's next tactic, of course. And so... The high priest, he stands up and he says to Jesus, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are Christ, the Son of God. 
and Jesus responds and gives him the confession because they had failed. They had failed to secure any witnesses to, to uh, indict him for anything. So Jesus does bring the confession. And he says, you have said so. And the, the, the literal words there are, I am. And it can be written as, it can be translated, I am or am I. Depends on how you want to translate it. But it can be translated either way. But when you hear that, when you hear I am, what do you hear? You hear Exodus, don't you? You hear God, I am, uh, that I am. So Jesus' response to the high priest is, I am, which would have just absolutely enraged everyone there. And then he says, but I tell you, he says, first he says, I am, so I, he takes on God's name and he agrees to the fact that he's Messiah and the Son of God. But Jesus goes on and he says, but I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And it's like, no, I, I don't blame them for, for <laughs> accusing him of blasphemy. So Jesus is saying, yes, I am the Messiah, I am God incarnate, I am the Son of God and I am the Son of Man. And the Son of Man is a reference straight out of, uh, of Daniel chapter 7, this is it here. I saw in the night visions and behold that with, the, uh, with the clouds of heaven there came one like the Son of Man. He came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And that was Jesus' claim before the high priest. This is me. And, uh, and truly indeed it, it is. This is the God of God, God of uh, of the universe, the King of Kings, the Messiah, the Son of God, and he s sits being judged by this Sanhedrin and a high priest. And, the, and the, the paradox of that or the irony of that is that, in fact, he is their judge, that Jesus is the one who sits on the front throne and Jesus will be the one that judges them on their judgment of him. It's ironic. And so the high priest tears his clothes off in, in a facade of self-righteous indignation and they, um, they condemn Jesus to death. They, what is your judgment? The high priest calls on, on those and they answer, he deserves death. And so at this point, I'll just stop and reflect a moment on how a trial under Jewish law was supposed to be held. Under Jewish law, um, a trial was, was to be held, must be held during the day. So the, high, the Caiaphas trial was at night. The Sanhedrin one was in the morning. But Caiaphas's one definitely broke the rules of a trial. It must take place in a specific courtroom and in the temple. Caiaphas' house is not a courtroom and was not to have taken place there. It must begin by hearing the defence. Did you see any defence? Was there any defence counsel at all? No, there wasn't. And it must not reach a conviction on the day that the trial began. So you weren't allowed to convict. There must be a day in between. So you hear the trial and then you take the night and you come back with a conviction. Is that what happens here? What do you think? What's the judgment? Dare. So they break, break that law as well. And it must not be on the eve of a festival or a Sabbath. We're on the eve of a festival and a Sabbath, aren't we? <laughs> festival Passover and the Sabbath coming. So the way in which the trial of Jesus is, 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 is um, done is, is against all, all Jewish tradition and, Ju and Jewish law as well. 
And um, I think Jesus stands with those uh, who have been falsely accused, who, who stand, who uh, participate or, or uh, fall uh, under injustice. And, and we live in a, a liberal Western democracy and we don't see that as Christians so much. Uh, but for a lot of people around the world, injustice, is particularly meted out upon those who, who follow Jesus, is something that is quite prevalent. And Jesus, uh, through this, is able to provide solace. You know, I've been through the injustice uh, of systems that persecute you and put you to death um, in, in a way that uh, is unjust. And I enter into that suffering with you. And that may be very fine. The high priest now has a conviction of blasphemy against Jesus. So he satisfies the religious group. Problem for the high priest is he can't take Jesus blasphemed uh, to Pilate. So what is he going to do with Pilate? So that's the next step. The high priest and the chief priests have to take this to Pilate and they come and they bring uh, Jesus to Pilate. Funny thing is, well, I find it amusing, is Pilate actually has to come out of his palace. It's a palace he has. He lives in a castle, I mean a, a palace. It was Herod the Great's palace, so you can imagine what it was like. It was quite substantial. Uh, he has to leave that. He has to come outside the gate of his palace to meet with the Jews because the Jews can't come in to his palace in case they get themselves unclean. Must have been such a frustrating bunch of people to rule over, I imagine. So they would have got poor Pilate off on the wrong foot to start with. Pilate has to come out of the front gate of his building and say, what do you want this time of morning? And, of course, they would have had to set up a... A, uh, a, a judgment seat at that point in time and Jesus would have been judged outside the walls of uh, Pilate's uh, palace at the time and, the, and the, 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 the crime that Jesus is, has uh, committed is, is here. He's misleading our nation, forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he is Christ, a king. So their, their accusation is, is on those things which are against Rome. So they're political, they're political issues. But the, really the, the central one is the, the fact that he calls himself king because that is the one that he'll be executed for and that's what they, they go for. And so that's Pilate's question and it's quite ironic. Who, who, remember who Pilate is? Pilate's the successor of Herod Archelaus who is a king. Pilate is the king of uh, southern Judea at that time, as it were. He is the king uh, of, of, of Judah. And so he says, so are you the king of the Jews? I mean, obviously, he's the king of the Jews. And uh, he has to ask him this question. And he starts to interrogate uh, Jesus at this, at this point. And clearly... Um, Jesus is the king of the Jews. Uh, Jesus is the king of all kings. And uh, he is standing uh, while Pilate sits in judgment over him. And again, we see the irony. But um, Pilate hears that he is from Galilee. And at this point, he goes, awesome. Don't have to deal with this. I'll send him over to Herod. And he sends him off to Herod, uh, Herod Antipas. And Herod's in town and he sends him there and Herod wants to spend some time with Jesus. But uh, obviously uh, nothing comes from that trial before Her Herod Antipas. He asks him a lot of questions. He mocks him. He clothes him in, in uh, robes and uh, beats him and makes fun of him. Uh, but Jesus doesn't even answer a word in response to Herod Antipas and he sends him back to Herod 
Oh, sorry, he sends him back to Pilate. So Pilate um, realises, okay, now I have to do something with this guy. So what Pilate does, he's clearly saying, look, he, he, the, the man's innocent. He sees through the facade of, of the Jewish chief priests and he's saying, you guys just want to kill him. He hasn't done anything wrong, not by, by Roman law. Uh, so I'm just going to punish him. I'm going to flog him and I'm going to release him. Okay? So that's what he tries to do. And, uh, but the, the crowds don't want any part of it. And so Herod goes, oh, sorry, uh, Pilate tries another tack. And he goes, okay, well, look, there's this tradition. I, I release two prisoners. Uh, I, I release a prisoner. How about I release to this Jesus or, or Barabbas? And, of course, the, the, the crowds come back and say, release to us Barabbas. And the crowds at this point are obviously not those crowds that have been following Jesus. The crowds here gathered before um, Pilate's uh, palace were a crowd that had been brought together by the chief priests uh, and the leaders who wanted to uh, see Jesus executed. And so Barabbas, the one who is guilty of insurrection, the one who is a murderer, is released. And the innocent... Uh, man in Jesus is taken and he is crucified and and that's that's the picture of the gospel isn't it that's the picture uh, of our redemption uh, we all stand as Barabbas convicted uh, guilty deserving of death uh, but Jesus came and stood in our place at this point um, Pilate's getting quite nervous. The, the, in one of the other Gospels, the, the, um, the high priest said, listen, you've got to convict this Jesus. He says he's the son of God. He's broken our law. And Herod's like, what? He's the son of God, being quite, you know, Romans have lots and lots of gods. He doesn't want to kill a god. So he's like, oh, no. So he takes Jesus back into his palace and he interrogates Jesus. And, and he talks to him about kingdom. And you have that, that dialogue bef between Jesus and, and Pilate about kingdom. And Jesus says, my kingdom's not of this world. My kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. My kingdom is greater than this kingdom. Uh, and if my father wanted to deliver me, he would. But this is part of his plan. And, and then... Pilate gets word from his wife, who's had a dream, and she says, have nothing to do with this man. And Pilate's like, oh man, he's a son, he's, he's a son of God, and he's my wife, now my wife's heard about him, how is that? He must be a God, I can't, I can't kill this guy. And so he goes out again, desperately, and he says, you know, I, he's, he's done nothing wrong here. He, we should release him. Uh, but finally he gives in to the crowds and he hands Jesus over to be crucified. And then he finally, and this is, we switch over to Luke, we get this passage. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing but rather a riot was beginning, he took water, he washed his hands before the crowd saying, oh, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. And in this final desperate attempt to relinquish himself uh, from responsibility, Pilate makes this symbolic, empty gesture to relieve himself of the guilt of, of Jesus' blood. Uh, and uh, the irony is it's, it's only the blood that he's trying to wash off his hands which is the blood that relieves him from his guilt. It's only through Jesus' blood 
that he can have forgiveness, that he can be, ta- be found not guilty, can he, that he can have that guilt washed away. And it's at this point that he just hands Jesus over to those who will crucify him. And that's where we go next week. Let's pray. Our wonderful Father, uh, as we consider and as we reflect on the injustice, the the wrongful way in which uh, you were treated, uh, the wickedness and the laziness and the the self-interest of the hearts of men um, who seek to dethrone you to abuse you um, to kill you and to overthrow you Uh, Father we stand in awe of your your grace your dignity um, your steadfastness to to stand and to to walk through that, that road of suffering that road of injustice that road of of indignity um, not for your own benefit but uh, that we may have life that that we may come into your family that we may be washed clean that we may be uh, restored and brought back uh, to you we want to say thank you lord jesus thank you for your love for us um, which drove you And thank you for the way in which you demonstrated your care, uh, the way in which you demonstrated your union with us in suffering uh, and the example that you set to us um, when going through persecution and hardship. May you receive the the glory and the honour and our praise today for your wonderful person. In Jesus' name, amen.